Hello, and thank you for coming. Uh, as was said, my name is Zach, and with me today is Ankur. And uh, today we're going to talk to you about Ambry and Venice and how we use TLA Plus at LinkedIn for these platforms. Ankur and I have a combined total of 16 years of working on data platforms at LinkedIn. Both of us have a particular affinity for working on replication protocols for distributed systems. And we have both found great value in using TLA Plus in our work. We're going to break this talk up into four main parts. For the first half of this talk, I'll walk through Venice and what problems it solves, and then move on to how we have used TLA Plus in Venice by doing some spec-driven development on algorithm we call LeapFrog. Afterwards, Ankur will close us out, out this talk by presenting Ambry and what components within Ambry we have modeled using TLA Plus and what it's taught us. Let's dive into it. Starting things off, what is Venice? Venice is a database that specializes in hosting derived data. What is derived data exactly? Well, we define derived data to mean data which has been processed, formatted, and ferned, maybe tossed around a little, from other data sources. Some examples of this would be the output of batch processing jobs, stream processing jobs, or AI model training. In fact, at LinkedIn, our AI engineers get a lot of leverage out of Venice. As an example, a team may run a model training job once a day or multiple times a day, and this training will output a large data set. Venice is able to consume that data set and make it available for querying from online applications at low latency. Oops, that didn't go to the next. Why did? Okay. Uh, to explore the concept of derived data a bit more concretely, here we see examples of primary data versus derived data at LinkedIn. In the case here, our primary data source is you. That's right, you. Proud LinkedIn members, hopefully. And the data direct from the source would be your profile. As you add things to your profile, interact with the site, and as other members in your network provide updates interact with the site, we stream those updates into our Hadoop grid. From there, we'll train models and compute input features, and at least once a day, sometimes more, we'll build our derived data set. In the case shown on the slide here, that derived, set is, that derived data set is empowering a LinkedIn feature called People You May Know, which is a feature that drives LinkedIn growth and member engagement. Today at over 2,000 production stores, Venice powers many products at LinkedIn, along with people you may know, like term and title standardization, search verticals, and even some security edge services. We target a P99 SLA of single digit millisecond for single key lookups, and for some instantiations of Venice, which leverage low latency clients, we target a P99 that is sub millisecond. We proudly open source Venice live at Strange Loop and have been building a community of users and contributors ever since. So now let's get to why we're all here. How are using TLA Plus? A few years ago, the Venice team found itself in a position where it needed to move to an active active architecture for rights. Previously, rights to Venice were serialized through a single channel. This had the advantage of being simple to reason about and to administer, but had several downsides otherwise. Rights were slow and native across data center bandwidth, and the right channel was a site of concern as a single point of failure for our system. Moving to an architecture where was an opportunity for us to solve these problems and add new features to boot. We could also now offer write operation types to our to new write operation types to our customers. The architecture we settled on to achieve this had us introduce a new concept of Venice called the Venice Leader Follower State Model. In this model, we have a Venice Leader, which uh, server, the Venice Leader server, actively pulling data across data center and publishing it to follower nodes. These leaders actively pull data from their data centers and, a full, and from all the data centers in a full replication mesh. Each writer publishing data is able to have its data direct, pulled directly in with no cross data center hop for the Venice cluster local to it, and then remote data centers get the data with a single hop. So everything was looking good. However, as it turns out, even with a solid design, things can happen. In Venice, servers bootstrap out of Kafka, and Kafka is how we're implementing our, or is how we're transmitting client operations. Any imaginable outage of Kafka is one where data integrity might be at risk. And then beyond Kafka, we could have errors in versions of, the, of our own software. Recall, we're building an entirely new replication architecture. So we will be iterating a lot. Venice servers in different data centers are all consuming write events individually now and transmitting to local replicas. This implies that Venice leader servers in different data centers at potentially different software versions need to come to deterministic conclusions. This itself isn't insurmountable, but it does mean we need to keep these sorts of things in mind. So to be able to be defensive to these sorts of things, these outages, we devised LeapFrog. It's the development of LeapFrog where we first began leveraging TLA+. So I'm gonna take a little bit of time to give an overview of LeapFrog. I do this with some trepidation, because as you will see later, I have had a very bad track record in communicating this algorithm to others. <laughs> 
briefly, LeapFrog is an algorithm that can generically be applied to any database where it's possible to consume that database's write ahead log on two replic for two replicas that you are trying to compare. It does so by consuming the change log of these two replicas and making determination on the result of those change logs to see if they diverge. The algorithm works in two stages. The first is determine starting points and change logs of the two replicas. It could be the beginning or it could be at the tail of the last compaction. It really depends case by case. The next step is to look at records either from a compacted view of the data set or row by row in the change log. Which you choose depends where you're trying to run LeapFrog, either in batch settings like on HDFS or in stream processing. It then comes to one of three conclusions. The data set is either consistent, all data is replicated, no inconsistencies. The data is not consistent yet, which will be the case for some amount of data at the tail for an eventually consistent system. Or the data has diverged, then the process repeats. Let's watch this in action. Here, I have the change log for one replica. The event, each event in the change log has a key, a value, and a vector of offsets or transaction IDs that we've labeled TS. This vector is meant to represent event IDs which correlate to upstream events transmitted by different sites. Since we're comparing two sites, our vector has two components. To dissect one of these, the first event in this change log represents a row keyed by bar with a value of fox and a TS that says this key was altered at offset zero from one site and offset 100 from another site. Now we introduce our second replica on another site. We can see that at the head of our topic, the second site has slightly different values for some keys. Then we get the, when we get the watermark over a section of change log of each replica, we're comparing. The high watermark is defined as a vector which contains the highest offsets of the updates we've heretofore seen from different sites. Looking at these two replicas, we can see that the DC2 has a high watermark with a component which is larger than the DC1 topic, but lower for another. This tells us that the DC2 topic has events from one site that DC1 does not have, but also is short some events from another site. In order to make our comparison, we need to make one of these replicas completely ahead of the other. We're gonna select one of these and have it leap over the other. Our leap should make sure that all the component vectors of the high watermark have progressed beyond the other replica we're seeking to compare. So now let's compare our keys. Our first key is bar. Both replicas have the same value for the key. They are consistent. No problem here. Now let's look at key foo. In DC1, key foo is set to the value horse. And in DC2, it's set to mule. Initially, the key in DC2 was based on a state where the high watermark was not completely ahead of the other replica. Now that it's moved ahead, we see that it has a value of burro. Since the key values are not the same, they're not consistent. But that doesn't mean they diverge. The record timestamp vector, uh, the record uh, TS vector indicates that the value in DC2 was updated by some message which is beyond the high watermark of DC1. This indicates that while the records aren't consistent, they might be consistent later. So we don't flag these rows for now. Now we get to key fizz where something finally interesting happens. <laughs> key fizz has differing values. Look at the record in DC1. Its record TS vector falls below the high watermark of DC2. This means that the replica represented by DC2 has seen all events that are pertinent to the final row result of the record in DC1. The same is true vice versa. The replica represented by DC1 has a high watermark that supersedes the TS vector for key fizz in DC2. So what does this mean? An inconsistency. The methodology of this algorithm asserts that the both replicas have enough information to come to the same conclusion, but did not for some reason. Maybe it was missing events, maybe it was an inconsistency in how the data was computed, maybe there was a solar eclipse. Interesting, but that's for whoever is debugging this issue to figure out. In our case, the leapfrog algorithm has done its job and flagged the error. And then finally, to finish out the algorithm steps, after doing our comparison, we now choose DC1 to be our leap DC and have it jump forward in time so that it now has a high watermark that is greater than DC2. We now see that the key foo did become eventually consistent between the two replicas, and the whole thing repeats itself so long as we have data to compare. Okay, so that, uh, that may have been a lot. That was a little fast, and that was a little bit of the point of this part of the talk. <laughs> and at this point, you're wondering what the hell just happened. You are in good company. LeapFrog was something I cooked up while writing a test plan for the new replication architecture. While exploring the various test scenarios we'd run the Venice architecture through, I came to realize that we would need a robust way to determine if two, Venice, two, Venice data cent two servers and two data centers would become consistent. Ideally, this would be something we could use both for testing and for alerting on the site. Initially, I thought the algorithm was something kind of intuitive, so I didn't waste much breath or ink on it. 
I wrote a one-page addendum to my testing document that explained the process and gave a single example for how it might work. Well, straightforward as a notion, easily derailed. <laughs> as we discussed how the comparison algorithm would work, we realized we would have to work through more examples to be certain that it would, in fact, detect problems for the scenarios that we were worried about. So a larger document was produced to go through the base algorithm to make sure we were all on the same page. And from there, we deliberated further. And then finding that prose was failing us, we sought more basic methods. It turns out, even with a simple algorithm, discussing and working through all the myriad ways things could go wrong was no easy task. What was worse, LeapFrog started to get more complex as we became increasingly concerned about edge cases and were no longer confident that the base algorithm could be applied to all scenarios we were worried about. So this is when I began exploring using TLA plus for modeling LeapFrog. After all this deliberation, I was no longer even sure that LeapFrog would work. It was already a high cost effort at this point to even spend all the hours documenting and deliberating on the algorithm, let alone what it might cost us to implement something that didn't work. Spending the time to learn TLA plus and write a spec seemed like an easy investment to make. The first thing we thought about when trying to write our spec was probably what many spec writers think about. What properties do we need? Well, our properties we chose reflects what we would find desirable in the system. We want this comparison to inform either a test result or an alert, which means that it must both detect inconsistencies when they exist and do not detect inconsistencies when there are none. Also type OK because good spec writers eat broccoli and check type constraints. These properties are critical for both tests and alerts. If an alert or test is flaky, you won't pay attention to it. And in some ways, that's just as bad as alert or test, which doesn't detect anything at all. Next, we set about defining the model. Our model just needs to account for the three situations we talked about earlier. A write which is eventually consistent, a write which is fully consistent, or a write which is not consistent and diverges. We express all of these as separate potential states and allow for the leapfrog comparison to run in, any, in, between of, in between any of those, just as it would in production. So now armed with our spec, we began running the model checker. It's here that we started to find the edge cases. The first edge case that we ran into was that leapfrog can only detect an inconsistency after the next write. This is because we need high watermarks to proceed. If the last write to your store is the one that got away, so to speak, then you won't detect it. If it takes a long time for that next write to show up, if ever, you will lose all forensics eventually that would have otherwise helped you figure out what caused the error in the first place. Second, the model checker was quick to point out that in the initial implementation of the spec, it allowed for offsets of messages to potentially get reused. If this ever happened, all bets are off. Having these things flagged by the model checker saved us an awful lot of headache. I'm sure there are many folks in this room who have had to add a new metric only after a specific outage in production. A key learning our team took away from using TLA plus is that TLA plus makes clear what you are assuming to be absolutely true in order for things to work. If you know what must be true in order for things to work, that tells you you should really put an alert on it. A spec can go a long way towards informing the operations side of a system in this way. Given the edge cases that were flagged, we knew we could take simple steps to be aware of them. First, to avoid the last write problem, we just need to make certain that the last write isn't a user write. To this end, we leverage heart beating in the replication channel. Next, to make sure that offsets aren't reused, we have simple checking in the server ingestion code that can detect and flag when something like that has happened, essentially observing if offsets ever regress below the high watermark. Another big one we got was that for all the complications we began to introduce when writing the pros version of the algorithm, we found with TLA plus that we could apply less steps to cover all the scenarios. We now knew the code could be straight, very straightforward to write and simple code could cover all edge cases. With this, we were able to proceed quickly with confidence we had gained through the spec we had written. Hand way to hand way to implement, implement. <laughs> now with our spec and a green model checker, we knew we were ready to implement. We started running LeapFrog as part of our test suite as we stressed the new architecture. Issues that were flagged, we knew we could take seriously thanks to the confidence that we had in the implementation, thanks to the TLA plus spec. So summing up this part of the talk, we have found great value in practicing spec-driven development with TLA plus. TLA plus enables us to have clear and high bandwidth communication about a spec and allows us to avoid the usual firing squad of counterexamples one must often feel during the RFC stage of designs. 
CLA plus is also useful in informing the operational side of things by highlighting what pieces are critically important when running your system. And also we have seen in Venice that the, as requirements have changed, we can iterate faster thanks to refinement in TLA+, and I've actually done one round of that in LeapFrog already. With refinement and the before mentioned advantages, refactoring doesn't mean we have to start the whole process over again. Future work here, we'd like to write a paper on LeapFrog, uh, maybe work through that model checker versus proof thing that Mark was talking about, <laughs> and open source all its components. Today, the initial LeapFrog implementation relies on a few non-open source LinkedIn technologies, but we're working to get it all completely open source into the Venice DB repo. At least the spec is open source, and you can take a look at it there. And then most important future work, all of your contributions. <laughs> we open source Venice with the intent of building a developer community around it, uh, so do please check it out. I have filed a backlog of good first-time contributor items for anyone curious, so please take a look. We're eager for your external contributions. Now I'm going to hand this off to Ankur for talk about Amri. All right, perfect. Hello, everyone, uh, and thanks, Zach. Uh, I'm going to spend some time talking about how Amri is leveraging or planning to leverage to TLA Plus. Um, and in order to warm you up to that, uh, I'm going to start with telling you what Amri is, give you a high-level overview of Amri's architecture, do a little bit of deep dive into Amri's replication protocol, because that's what will drive some of the discussions, and then uh, finally use that deep dive to give you a flavor of at least one problem we are exploring TLA plus for. And all of this, I'm going to do it in 10 minutes. All right, so let's look into what is Amri. Amri is LinkedIn's blob store. It's a distributed storage system that is designed to be highly available, horizontally scalable, and very, very reliable. Uh, we all are, a lot of us are distributed systems engineers. We know everything comes with you know, gotchas. But yeah, it was, it was created at LinkedIn and open sourced in 2016. Uh, do check out our GitHub repo to learn more. As you can see, Never mind. Um, yeah, so it's it's basically a feature-packed storage system. Um, um, yep, it's a feature-packed storage system. And I, in the interest of time, I'll highlight two key features real quick. It stores multiple copies of its data in geo-replicated replicas. Any of these replicas can accept blob updates. It's a multi-leader system. Given that it's a multi-leader system, it's unique in providing strong get after port guarantees. That means if a blob is uploaded in one of the data centers, and is followed by a gate from a remote data center, immediately after the upload, the gate is always guaranteed to succeed. Hint, hint, it's a handle store. Here's a very high level overview of Amri's architecture. Data nodes, front end nodes, and cluster managers are the three main components. Data nodes provide the persistence layer, store Amri's data. Um, Amri randomly groups data into virtual units called partitions, and each partition has multiple replicas. A disk on a data node can contain replicas of multiple partitions. Front ends receive requests from users, perform pre-processing, access check, encryption, decryption, comp compression, and a host of other stuff, and determine which data node the request should be routed to. Uh, cluster managers keep track of the state and health of the cluster and location of the various replicas of each partition. Ambry uses quorum-based consistency model to trade off high availability and performance with strong persistence and guarantees. The quorum policy is configurable at all the layers. As an example, um, a port request in the example sends the data to three replicas of a partition in parallel, and a separate configuration is the success target, which determines the number of replicas that should send success to the front end for front end to send success to the client. So in the last slide, we saw how we use quorum to synchronously like data to multiple, but a subset of all replicas. The other replicas learn about this data via asynchronous replication. This replication tracks the ordered log of each replica. A typical replication policy uh, topology uses all-to-all -all replication in local data center, while a designated leader replica does cross data center replication. An example is shown in the right. It's a pool-based replication system where each, where the replica initiating the replication pulls the data from its peers. Uh, it, each replica maintains a replication token to track its progress against its peer. Um, and a typical replication cycle is where, for example, replica B, which is replicating, requests the 
for the next set of data from replica A after the saved replica to replica token K. Replica A then responds by sending the next set of updates, which replica A can consume and forward its replication token. In Embry, the blobs are append only. So other than get and put, Embry supports TTL update and delete. We call them metadata operations. And the quorum consistency applies to metadata operations as well. Um, an important point which might become relevant later is that right now, only update that the TTL update API allows is to make a blob permanent. So now that we know a little bit of what Embry is, let's take a look at why we are why we started using TLA plus for Embry. Building simple systems is complex. Turns out, keeping them simple as they evolve is actually harder. Over the years, we have evolved Embry multiple times since it was built to add more features and optimizations to it. When thinking about and designing all those changes, we have had similar problems like Zach mentioned earlier. Uh, multiple brainstorming session, going through different corner cases, long documents trying to prove everything will work in all the corner cases, and concerns around complexity added to the system, et cetera. Let's look at one such design problem where I faced this problem particularly, and that actually led me to store, explore TLA plus. As we scaled Ambry's clusters and new high throughput use cases onboarded to Ambry, we realized that we need to make Ambry's metadata operations more scalable and robust. Without going into too much details in the interest of time, this needed enhancements in a lot of core components of Ambry, but in particular, the enhancement to replication was the most complex. As we thought about the problem and explored multiple designs, even after eliminating the ones that had either high complexity or other dependencies, we ended up actually exploring seven different design choices. For each of them, we reasoned about correctness and complexity and corner cases in a doc. And there was, I remember, the, the insanity that there was at least one doc that was 30 pages long. We had over 35 diagrams for various designs attempting to demonstrate correctness and safety. We spent continuous hours, countless hours, reasoning about complexity, thinking about corner cases. And while our final solution we think was pretty elegant and simple, we started a multi-quarter implementation effort. And without building it first, there was no formal or scientific way to prove that it will indeed work and not lead to any safety violation of existing guarantees in the system. So based on that experience while designing metadata operations, we felt that there had to be a better way to validate the design. While discussing about corner cases in a doc or in meetings is indeed valuable, we felt that we needed to have a more scientific way to represent our design decisions and to use that as a basis to talk about simplicity and validate corner cases. And there has to be a better way to explore the entire space of a design deterministically. That brought us to TLA Plus. The things that I'm going to take talk about next uh, are much more modest than what Venice and Zach has achieved with TLA Plus. Um, it is actually inspired by the initial success they have had with TLA Plus. Um, and Embry is currently in a very, very early stages of exploring formal methods. Let's look at how TLA Plus will help with some of the concerns about, I talked about to keep it simple. Since I have explored it for enhancements in Ambry, I'll just stick to refinements and propose a two-step solution. Create a base spec to prove that a component works and then create refinements on top of the base spec to reason about future enhancements. I'll just talk about the first problem that I explored the TLA Plus for and which can hopefully illustrate everything that I talked about. Um, what I'm going to show you is how I was able to take a spec for one of the components uh, and then create a small, quick refinement on top of it for a new feature enhancement to, demon to demonstrate not only that the new feature meets its own correctness guarantees, but also that existing guarantees are not violated. When we were thinking about efficient metadata operations, one of the things we did want to explore later was to enhance the TTL update API in Ambry. As I showed earlier, currently TTL update only makes a blob permanent. We wanted to explore enhancement to the TTL update API to enable users to extend the TTL of a blob to a particular value, to a specific value. There are some nuances on how this will work end to end, but uh, for the purpose of this talk, I want to focus only on conflict handling during replication. So if you look at only conflict handling during replication, I want to claim that there are two core requirements that we need. Um, in the presence of conflicting TTL updates, the largest TTL should win. And if a replica has multiple TTL updates for a blob, the latest one should have the highest value. Using our template from last slide, we need two steps, create a base spec to prove replication works, 
um, and then create refinements on top of the base spec to reason about feature enhancements. So as a first step, we created the base spec to show that replication works. Um, I am the good TLA plus spec writer as Zach referred to earlier, and I do it my broccoli. So uh, we started with defining the state spec for replication. There are three main states. Replica log, where each operation is appended. Replica token, that each replica maintains to track its progress against peers and the state of the replica itself. Um, each replica can be in one of the multiple states, uh, and it can take writes only if it is a leader or a standby. Um, as we saw, replica could support three types of write operation, put, delete, and TTL update. For each of these operations, there is a condition in the spec to check if the operation can be accepted by the replica. For example, for put, the check is to ensure that replica is up and doesn't already have the blob. For delete, the check is that replica is up and has the blob. These are, these are some few of the checks. And for TTL update, there is a check that replica is up it has a blob, and the blob is not already deleted. So essentially, there is a check whether or the operation can be accepted or not. We also defined state transitions due to replication, and finally, we added some safety checks to ensure that after each transition, some of the safety conditions are not violated. Okay, now this is the main part of, of my talk. Um, now that we had the TLA plus spec for replication in place, let me show you how simple it was to enhance it to support the enhanced TTL update API. We already looked at these two requirements earlier. In order to make meet this requirement, all we needed to do was to update the check of each operation, in this case, the TTL operation in the spec, and add a new check that says TTL can be updated to the new value only if the replica doesn't have the TTL message with the larger TTL value. And we, had, we added some safety and correctness checks for each state transition, and one of them was to ensure that for each blob, the latest TTL update has the highest value. That's all. That's all we needed to change in the replication spec to show that the, the, TTL update, the new TTL update API will work, and it will not violate any of the existing guarantees and safety requirements as well. That's all I had for my talk today. Uh, we obviously have a lot of work to do in terms of our uh, future work. And yes, at this point, I'll open the floor for questions. Thank you. Um, so we have one question over here. Well, we have the next speaker set up. Hi. How did you come across TLA Plus, and how was your learning experience? Yeah, so I'll go. So uh, literally my experience uh, picking up TLA Plus, so, uh, uh, Marcus and Leslie came and gave a talk about LinkedIn a while back. Um, I had attended it, uh, absorbed maybe a quarter of it, and then, you know, literally finding myself very frustrated trying to work through this leapfrog example and being hell-bent on proving my colleagues wrong, I uh, started looking into TLA+, and I had posted on the GitHub repo, and that's where uh, Marcus reached out to me and offered to teach me, show me some ropes, and I've been using it ever since. And then I, I think you were also at a... Yeah, I was at, at, at one, of the, uh, one of the sessions that Marcus conducted at LinkedIn about TLA Plus, and same experience. I tried to get as much as possible, uh, and then later on I chatted with Zach, and he had some su success with it. And as we were exploring this space, we thought that we could start looking at TLA Plus. Any other questions? Another round of applause? Thank you. Thank you.